Hello and welcome to Fierce. This program celebrates the diversity of LGBTIQ identities and perspectives. Fierce is produced in Bundjalung country at 2NCR Lismore and can also be heard on podcast at fiercefm.podbean.com and in New Zealand on Fresh FM as well as all over Australia through the Community Radio Network. Fierce FM on Spotify and YouTube. I want to honour the traditional owners of the lands where you are living. They took care of these lands for thousands and thousands of years and then shared this land with us at great cost to their own lives. I want to thank them for the care they have given and continue to give to sit on the earth, listen and care for country. I also want to thank the fairies and crones who came before us in history to fight for our human right to love fiercely. It's the 4G from heaven. The Tweed Regional Museum is launching their first digital exhibition all about the LGBTIQ history from the early 1900s till now. The Rainbow Region, Erica Taylor, Ticozy and Tobin. Hi, I'm one of the co-curators of Small Town Queer, a project that looks at the history of LGBTQIA plus people and stories in the Tweed. We've worked with 20 participants from the local community tell their stories and it's an ongoing project and we're really, really excited. Small town tea cosy, uncle sexy fucker, very, very much a community person. You've been involved in the history project for a long time and the work you've been doing already part of why Tweed Regional Museum made this happen. My pronouns are he, they and darling. The amazing people at the Tweed Regional Museum realised that their great museum in Mwollombar wasn't very queer. They contacted me because they knew that I was involved in LGBTIQ history of the Northern Rivers for the last 10 or 15 years, auspiced by the Tropical Fruits. The Northern Rivers Queer History Project's been going for about 10, 15 years, started by Peter Mitchell, carried on by me. They approached me and said, would you be able to give us a hand? And I was excited in the extreme because have our story changed in a public museum is fantastic and it's suddenly happening all over the place. Western Australian Museum has just announced that it's going queer. Look at why it hasn't got much queer information or history or objects and it's going to start talking about the queer history of WA. Tobin Saunders or Vanessa Wagner, very famous choreographer, dancer, actor, DJ, acon worker, performer, writer, social commentator, satire, gorgeous, Wagner or Wagner? It's Wagner after 6pm and it's Wagner during the day. (laughs) Tobin, how are you involved in this exhibition? Erica and Emma Shields. I saw Emma at a diversity walk in the Tweed. We were just having a chat about the region history and just saying to Emma, it would be really good to get diverse representation of queer history in the Northern Rivers. And then true to Emma's word, it was a real honour to be included. I recorded a podcast and I'm one of the queer icons, which is also a great honour. And I think we've had a lot of exclusion and erasure and colonising and patriarchy of our culture. And I think we're seeing it all falling apart and coming back into a colourful new kaleidoscope. History like this is hard to find. In my life, I've hidden. I've been very good at hiding. More out now than ever, because I guess the world's a friendlier place for our colours and our vibrance and our spectrum of where we fit. And going back, looking at how people had to hide, actually unsafe and illegal. How is that feeling? For myself, I am straight, but as the curator of the museum, it is my job to tell everyone's history and provide the platform for those voices that haven't had that platform in the past. And speaking to all the members of the community, feedback has been, I've never been listened to in that way. I've never had the opportunity to tell my story before. So it's been really exciting. Mwollomba, just like it has a world-class art gallery and the Tweed Regional Gallery, it also now has a capital city style world-class museum. Mm. Well worth a visit. Someone who, as a teenager in the 60s, discovering my sexuality, absolutely feeling the I was the only person in the world. There were no role models in film and television that I had seen anyway in the way of literature. So I had to really seek that stuff out. At the same time, being very careful because I had a very clear message that of what I was, the word was homosexual in those days. Not only was it illegal, I wasn't very much under the possibility of being attacked and injured, certainly ostracised. In 
And so it was difficult. Lucky, I think, when I was 18 or 19, and I somehow I worked out there was a place you could go, a beach, and somehow found somebody. And uh, that person was a really seminal person in my life. And then actually said, look, there's a world out there, and this is what it is, and you need to get involved. But it took me a very long time. In my early 20s at university, I remember the first year being very nervously walking up the stairs in the union building past the signs that talked about the gay lib group, but not making it obvious that I was reading it. And then took another year to go to one of the meetings and get involved. Once I broke the ice, things changed dramatically. I spent a lot of my early life really just self-discriminating, being very careful to only come out to people who I felt were supportive. Uh, but I was lucky to get involved in a group called Gay Men's Rap. We sat around starting to talk a lot about what our lives were like and sharing our stories and even getting plays up and writing stuff. And so which beach was that and where did you grow up, T Cozy? <laughs> I can't say that. It was St Kilda Beach and, and I grew up in Melbourne. I don't know how I worked all this out, but I somehow worked it out. Lay on this beach for a couple of weeks over summer until a man came over and invited me for a gin and tonic and the rest was history. And having met one person who introduced me to more people who told me about venues and places and then showed me about Camp Inc which was a magazine and camp, the organisation and a pub and the saunas which was great as well. Um, off I went really. I came up here in 1980 to the Northern Rivers because there were eight gay men from Sydney and Melbourne who'd bought a property in 1979 at the back of Nimbin and one of them was my best friend. We were best friends at school but we didn't know we were gay until we actually met about six months after we left school. So I came up and there was quite a strong community here in the 1980s in Lismore, hidden away a little bit. And as you'll see on the museum's Small Town Queer website, there was only one place you could get a gay magazine and you had to go all the way to Tweed Heads to, I think, was it called Borderline? Borderline Books, yeah. Books, yeah, and then, you know, and then go in and then sort of go down the back where all the porn magazines were in plastic bags and so Campaign was there in plastic bags. I remember campaign. I grew up with a lot of shame and was at the beats in Sydney at the beaches at Coogee and Bondi. I remember being a young person with my shame, but part of the whole eroticism was around that heartbeat going, oh, this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. And the danger, bashings, there was murders happening on those cliffs. For the project, we did research beats in the Tweed. Obviously, we're not naming any, but people can read that story on the story map. I think we had to place the marker on Wharf Street. I think it's outside Borderline Books. Actually, beats were such an important part of culture back then. It's changed now with the internet. But historically, we thought that was a really important thing to include. That internalised hatred and shame, especially when you're really young and maybe you don't quite subscribe to a gender norm or a performance of your gender. And that was my case. I was a very petite man. So I got bullied from a very early age at school and our family had moved to Perth, which in comparison to Sydney was kind of like a small town. No representation in the media in the 70s. If there was, it was quite campy and almost a little bit homophobic in its presentation. No recognition, no role models, no feedback, no cultural or legal support. Yeah, that really leads to self-hatred and shame. And I had to race back to Sydney to hang out with an elder brother who was was very supportive of me and helped me through that journey. And like you, T Cozy, I happened upon a social group called the Sydney Gay Youth Group. At first I was resistant. It was like, I don't need any support. You know, the general community needs to get its act together and they need the support to stop hating on us. But as it turned out, I met lots of really interesting people and that journey continued right through the 80s and 90s. Like a lot of people from other parts of Australia, the Northern Rivers are a real magnet because there's a beautiful energy here and there's lots of queer people here now. Thanks to people like you, T Cozy, it's those early adopters that helped make this place safer each year. Eric, I'd love to hear a song from this region. Ciala Robson. They are one of our... They went from the small town queer mob listening to... Fierce, Fierce FM. FM. <laughs> T Cozy, I know you saw photos of two women who hitched a horse to a cart and travelled from Sydney to the Tweed. 
and had to get veterinary help with the horse and ended up living in this region. That story was created by the museum and Erica and Emma when they were looking at their collection of 18,000 or 180,000 objects. <laughs> they realised they had nothing that even gave a hint or represented queer but they did have this photo of these two women and we don't know whether they were lesbian or not but it's a part of a new awareness about what I call queer objects. They showed me this photo and, and I thought wow that's amazing. There possibly were some women who were travelling around who were relatively left alone and much easier for a couple of women to be together than it would have been for, say, a bunch of men. I thought, yeah, that's fantastic. That's a story that tells me that we were always around or possibly always around. The further back you go, the less there are records. Two of the people I've been talking to were Vera Bourne and Michael Bray, who both came up here in the late 70s. Vera's passed just recently. Vera had a farm out of Dorby and she and her partner had been working in Sydney before in the counselling service. So it was well known that if you were coming up to the Northern Rivers, come and stay with Vera and her partner. It's an open house. Uh, similarly, Mike set up a cafe in Lismore in the early 80s called The Double Dutch, just uh, near the railway station there. And that was the first public queer venue in the region, I think, really. And he made that an open house. Had amazing full moon parties and lots of fun and games happened there, music and, and people could come and get together. And the, the straight community was very welcome as well. So it was open to all those who supported and were happy to help support us in having a space where we were safe. The local newspaper, started to go crazy the northern star in the early 80s and became very homophobic and then AIDS came along and exacerbated all that as well a lot of women came to the region escaping with their partners domestic violence or from their straight relationships bringing their children with them because in the city their children were possibly going to be taken away from them because they weren't fit and proper mothers the coaster social club is also a feature i'm interested to know a little bit about the coast obviously it's a razzle dazzle town but what was it like in the 50s we discovered quite a big scene around the greenmount area around the 50s and 60s mainly because that's where the train line ended from Brisbane and so a lot of people would come down on the train to party and there was quite the scene at the surf club for gay men who weren't out definitely wasn't open because it was very unsafe but it was happening behind closed doors and it was happening in the surf club dormitories everyone knew that was the place to go and that's what you did and that's a great story people can read on our story map but, you know, it's mixed with violence as well. The quote from the vice president of the surf club at the time was, you'd go out and bash a poofter, but go back to the dorm and fuck your mate. So that's the kind of complex scene that was happening there. And it's well worth reading. But we didn't go too far into the Gold Coast in our research. As Ian can attest, it takes so much time to research the history. Ian's done Lismore and the greater area and we feel like this was a great opportunity to broaden out the history into the Tweed, and we have to get all these kind of small towns doing their own history so we can merge it all up and get this big, beautiful picture of Australia's regional queer history. There's a big feature as part of this exhibition about Akon. Tropical Fruits of Mandala. Go to the website and read the Mandala story that Ian has written, which is fantastic. And a huge shout out to the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives who have provided just some of the most amazing photos of the property and of activities that were happening, doing all the building nude, having lunch clothed, I might point out. <laughs> Great photos to go and have a look at. Certainly is. Yeah. So it's lovely to see some penises in the museum's exhibition. I love that. You know, we're under Tweed Shire Council and they let us put some dicks on the internet. So <laughs> done an exhibition, Caravans and Communes, and that talked about the people who came and created communities during the summer. And then, of course, the whole commune thing that was happening across the region, including the Tweed Shire. But there's nothing about Mandala. And it was quite a significant place in a way because it was Australia's first, I think, ever and maybe only up until recently gay commune in a rural area and it was in the Tweed Shire right smack dab in the middle there near Yukai. They weren't hidden away either. David was quite a well-known TV film and drama producer. So it was this commune and I turned up in 1979. I heard about it uh, and, and I was blown away. I had realised I was a hippie as well as a gay man and here were a whole bunch of gay hippies prancing around doing the maypole, taking mushrooms and marijuana and eating communal meals and uh, living on this beautiful property at the back of you, Kyle, you could see Mount Warning when you sat on the composting toilet. Looking at that fantastic history and in the last two weeks being on the main street in Tweed Heads with 30 young people, mainly trans,
transgender, diverse, non-binary people proudly waving their flags, people driving past honking their horns, very small amount of trans or homophobia and a new generation of young people feeling safe and free to explore themselves on the street. It's paying homage to those preceded us to help us create safe spaces, but also for us to learn from how young people now and how they negotiate this interesting new world, which is very different from our old clunking steam driven world, it seems. Thank you so much, Erica and the team and all of you for doing this. And if people want to find Small Town Queer, and if you just type in the search engine Small Town Queer Exhibition, it comes up. up. Yeah. Yep, it pops, it pops up. up. And the most important thing is, is that it's an ongoing online exhibition and there's this space to tell your own story. And it really is a great opportunity for those stories to be started to be collected. So really, I encourage everybody, if you've got a story or you know somebody who's got a story, even if they've just spent a visit or a period in a small town or they've lived in the area, tell your story. Um, you can be anonymous. And that way we start collecting more and more of our hidden history. I want to talk about a song that's not regional, but it was a song that came out in the 1980s and it was the first time I'd ever heard the word gay on the public radio and it was the Tom Robertson band and it was Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay. That's a big song hmm? from Mardi Gras 78, isn't it? A gay band, a gay record, a gay song, a song with the word gay and positive. Thanks for coming on the fears. Take care yourselves. Bye. The British police are the best in the world. I don't believe one of these stories I've heard about them raiding our pubs for no reason at all. Lining the customers up by the wall Picking out people, knocking them down Resisting arrest as they're kicked on the ground Searching their houses, calling them queer I don't believe that sort of thing happens here Not likely Sing if you're glad to be gay if you're happy that way, hey, sing if you're glad to be gay. Sing if you're happy that way. Pictures of naked young women are fun in tidbits and Playboy, page three of the sun. There's no news in gay news or one magazine, but they still find excuses to call us obscene. How disgusting we are in the press The Telegraph people and Sunday Express Molesters of children, corruptors of youth Is there in the paper it must be the truth So try and sing if you're glad to be gay Just left in the dark I had a mate who was gentle and short He was only one evening and went for a walk Queer bashers caught him, kicked in his teeth Was only hospitalised for a week So try and sing if you're glad to be gay Sing if you're happy that way As they closed out our clubs Arrest us for meeting And raid on our pubs Make sure your boyfriend's At least 21 So only your friends and your brothers Get done Lie to your workmate Lie to your folks Put down the Queen's tell Anti-queer jokes They lived ridiculous Joined their laughter The buggers are legal now What more are they Sing if you're glad to be gay Sing if you're happy that way
With a wistful moon. <laughs> Hi kids, I'm Mark Trevorrow and you're on Fierce FM. Fierce! Can you hear the birdies singing? They're fierce too. Toby, so hey we've had a quick change because we're going to be talking just briefly about the Red Ribbon Appeal, which is Acon's biggest and most iconic campaign. It's been happening for decades. AIDS Awareness Week runs from the 24th of November until the 1st of December, which is World AIDS Day. And of course, COVID has really thrown a spanner in the works this year. Normally, we would have teams of people in Sydney and in regional areas taking out red ribbon boxes and offering them up to people for donations. We do actually have a stall at Lismore Square this year on World AIDS Day, which is great. We thought that was going to be cancelled. It's ultimately an opportunity for us to promote to the wider community community, the issues around HIV and AIDS and that um, HIV hasn't gone away and that stigma is still a large part of someone's experience living with HIV, but also just to keep people up to date with where we're at and to celebrate the survival of people, but also to acknowledge those people that we've lost to the epidemic. Oh, it's a hot one. And uh, oh. back in the 90s, I think it was, that I was involved in Ankali. Yep. But things are so yep. different now. I hear there might be a new prep which will be injected. Yes, look, in a nutshell, things have improved for most people in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. The rate of HIV transmission is twice that of the non-Aboriginal community. So we really need to ensure that no one is left behind. In New South Wales, which is the jurisdiction that ACOM works in primarily, we've had a real reduction in HIV diagnosis and that's because of PrEP. So for listeners who don't know what that is, it's basically the, the pill for HIV, preferably taken daily and it will stop someone from contracting HIV even if they have condomless sex. And you were right, there's uh, some trials around injectable PrEP so people can have a little jab and that will last for a certain amount of time and they don't need to worry about taking a pill each day. We still encourage people to use condoms and to have regular sexual health screenings, but we also are encouraging those who are interested to take PrEP. Also for people like myself who have been living with HIV for 30 years, to ensure that people are taking their medication and that they have an undetectable virus and therefore are uninfectious. So you've got this several pronged attack, hopefully eradicating HIV transmissions in not just New South Wales, Australia and the rest of the world. So yeah, we want to upscale testing. We want to make sure people are on treatment and we want to make sure people are aware of PrEP. And we want people to not be stigmatised because that stops people from seeking care and support. I think you'll find that a lot of HIV positive people are still frightened about having relationships and intimacy with people and the fear of being rejected in clinical settings. Service providers may not be up to scratch with the latest information. Uh, HIV positive people end up being advocates and feeling a bit marginalised. I think it's that leftover vibe that this is seen as some really scary death sentence. And in fact, it's a chronic but manageable condition like diabetes. ACON's been working for a few years on ending HIV. How is that going? Compared to the average last five years, there's been 17% reduction. But as you've seen in COVID, the only way for people to find out they have a pathogen, a virus, is to get tested. So the testing is absolutely critical. Luckily, we live in a state where people can go to a sexual health clinic and get a free anonymous STI screen. They don't need a Medicare card. It's preferable, but uh, they're not discriminated against. So it's going really well. Obviously, that was a bold goal, ending HIV by 2020. We're there. We haven't ended it, but we are definitely on track to ending it. Just for a personal moment, Tobin, how does that feel to you, having lived with this virus for a long time? It feels really interesting. You know, I've had discussions with other HIV positive people and some people are like, oh, we're ending HIV and this is really exciting and there's all this progress. And then there's a whole cohort of people who have been long-term survivors of HIV. And it's like, well, it's not ending it for me. I'm, I'm hanging in there, I'm on treatment, but you know, things aren't rosy for all POS people. There's a lot of depression, anxiety, substance use, poverty. But for me, it's really exciting seeing people, particularly young people, accessing something like PrEP and sort of taking control of their sexual health. Um, and the great thing about accessing PrEP 
particularly when it was a trial, was that people were part of an STI screening program every three months. So they were connected to care. It's with mixed feelings. Always um, World AIDS Day brings up opportunity to reflect. And that can be really sad because many of us have lost a lot of wonderful dear people. And of course, we know that it's killed over 35 million people around the planet. Where can people go to find out more? Redribbonappeal.org.au. It's a fantastic website. You can host a Red Ribbon fundraiser, as you said, dedicate a virtual Red Ribbon. You can purchase Red Ribbon merchandise online or you can make an online donation. Look, it is assuming that everyone's got access to the internet and a computer, but it's how we have to respond in an agile way during this time when we can't be there in person handling ribbons and being close to people, which is what we really want to do. Thank you so much, Toby, for all you do. I mean, for so many years, you've been fighting for our community. Our community is fierce. I love our community and you are fierce as fuck. Oh, thank you so much and have a great AIDS Awareness Week and uh, World AIDS Day. Thanks, darling. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Fierce. Fierce. This program celebrates the diversity of LGBTIQ identities and perspectives. Fierce is produced in Bundjalung country at 2NCR Lismore and can also be heard on podcast at fiercefm.podbean.com and in New Zealand on Fresh FM, as well as all over Australia through the Community Radio Network. Fierce, Fierce FM on Spotify.